Okay, everyone, let's get started. So today is a very important day, and I think a day that uh, you all will enjoy a lot as I have prepared a full lesson just on the fun things of graphing. So this is not uh, necessarily going to be on the SAT, although it'll, it'll help with some of the areas, but this is mainly driven out of your interest and your feedback. Many people said that they wanted to learn more about graphing on the quiz yesterday. Uh, many people said that just casually, you know, when I asked that graphing would be a fun topic. So uh, thanks to all of you for being here. There are only 20 of us, but that's perfect. So um, the smaller the class, some, in some cases, the better because you all can ask as many questions as you want. So think of this as almost like a small seminar. So today's the final day for the ninth and 10th graders, okay? If there are ninth and 10th graders who are going to take calculus, if they're like very advanced, if they're uh, you know going to maybe take calculus in 10th grade, they can attend tomorrow. But really today's the final day for them because uh, tomorrow and Thursday, we're going to be talking about uh, sort of introduction to calculus. And I'm going to just introduce these big ideas. We're not going to be masters of calculus by the end of these two days. It takes way longer than two days to really, um, to really master calculus, but uh, the big ideas will be introduced and sort of the fun things of calculus uh, will be covered. So um, for the ninth and 10th graders, thanks for being a part of this course uh, and keep in touch with me. Um, I'll be sending final grades out uh, by August 8th, I think that's the date. Uh, it was orig originally gonna be earlier, but I wanted to give the tutors some more time to process the grades and to uh, collect uh, people's grades and so it's not like a time crunch for them because many of them actually have their own exams uh, because many many of them are taking classes this summer at UTD online so okay so any questions about organizational things it's pretty straightforward from here all the only homework you, you don't have any homework you just um, you know really just submit your corrections if you if you didn't do well on an assignment submit those things and uh, enjoy. That's really the, the goal of the rest of the course. Okay, I'm assuming no questions. So, graphing is one of the best ways of visualizing relationships in nature. It's often, especially if you're uh, a theorist, if you go into something like math or physics, uh, although physics can be very experimental, but if you're a theorist, most graphs stem from equations. So, most graphs are a representation of equations, right? So you have some relationship, like, um, I mean, there are so many famous relationships, but maybe you have, uh, yeah, you, you have some, some relationship between distance and velocity, say, or position and momentum. And those are, you know, you have some definite uh, equation for that, and then you would plot that equation. So graphing can be a way of, uh, explaining how one variable relates to another variable. But it's not always that. A, a graph can also be a, just a plot, right? So people like statisticians will just have, you know, maybe, um, you know, number of people and uh, age or something, you know, and they'll be collecting some data and they'll make like a bar graph, you know, and it'll look like this. So this is a kind, this is also a graph. and. Uh, this is not the type of graph, th these are very useful, but we're not going to be talking about uh, bar graphs and scatter plots. You know, maybe, maybe a statistician would have uh, something like um, height and age, you know, height and age. And then th that person would make a scatter plot, right? It'd take like a thousand pieces of data and he would find, maybe this is like age zero and you know, age 10. And he would find some roughly linear relationship, right? Because people tend to grow somewhat linearly and maybe there would be some exponential part. So he could, he could fit some curve, you know, he could fit some curve to this data uh, and then analyze maybe that this is linear, so on and so forth. We're not going to be talking about data collection and statistics and uh, these types of things. Although this is such an important part of the scientific process. This is sort of the beginning of the scientific process. You collect data, you make some observations and that inspires you to fit some equations to these things we're going to be talking about things in a more theoretical sense. So we're going to be talking about things uh, as if we have some equation to model reality, and then we're going to plot that equation, discover these relationships. 
So I just wanted to highlight this dichotomy uh, within the sort of world of graphing um, that I'm recording. <laughs> okay. So often graphs are just maps, right? In a sense that, you know, you, you can have a map of the earth. Well, sometimes graphs are just maps of 2D space or 3D space. And there are many examples of this. And um, I think I'm going to be a bit uh, selfish and I'm going to show you my website because I think, uh, let's see here, close. How do I do this? Examples. Um, this, is, this is a little bit, I hope you all can see this. Uh, I have several graphs of just things I've plotted for fun. And uh, for example, look, uh, Say I have a disk. Okay, I'll try to explain. This is just an example. I just want to sort of explain to you what, what's going on here. Uh, so graphs as maps. For example, in this first example, I have a disk, right? And it's like, do you all know what a turntable is? You know, where you'd play records? In the days of record players, you have a table that turns. The entire thing turns around and around. So this entire thing is rotating, right? With some angular velocity. but it's okay, we don't need that. Say you put some particle on here, you put like a penny or something on there, and you want to see what happens as you know this thing rotates, what happens to its path. And so that's exactly what I plotted here. You have all sorts of fictitious, what are called fictitious forces, the Coriolis and centrifugal forces. And anyway, I just plotted some examples of what happens if, you know, given some initial conditions. And you can see the axes here, X and Y. This is a map, see, X and Y. This is just a map of, what happens? See here, this particle goes whoop like that, and it goes off to, you know, in this direction. So these are just, um, this, this is as simple as a graph can get, right? In a sense, this is the most intuitive type of graph when you have spatial dimensions on both or, you know, multiple axes, because then you know that you're just plotting the thing, you're plotting the way things would look, right? And it's assumed that uh, both of these things are a function, that X and Y are both a function of time, right? So these types of graphs, the way I've plotted it here, these are called parametric curves, and we're going to talk a bit more about them. But uh, my main point at this juncture is that these are um, just maps of reality. Let me show you another map of reality. Here is a particle in a cone. Okay, here again, look, x, y. So if I, so this is a three-dimensional problem. I'll try to explain sort of what's going on. But if I had a cone, we talked a lot about cones, right? When we were talking about conic sections. And I put up, yeah, have you ever been to like a mall or something and you put, they have these big, huge cones and then you put a penny here and you watch it, you watch it go inward like this, right? It, gravity pulls it down, but you also give it some initial, you give it a little push and that's what makes it go in spirals. Well, if you were looking down, I'll try to draw an eye here. If you were, this is a big eye. If you were looking down, right? Here's your eye. If you were looking down on the cone, this is exactly what you would see. And I modeled this mathematically, uh, you know, using some method of physics. And that method is not important. What is important is that you can see that the, the penny started here and it rolled and rolled and it went in these, this beautiful spiral. And you can see that it also accelerated because the spacing of the spiral grew as it went, right? So it, it got faster and faster and it covered more ground, so to speak, as it went down. So anyway, this is a, this is a path, right? See, it's this path of mass, and you can see that this is just a map, right? You're looking down. You, I lost a dimension. I lost the z dimension, but th this is, in a sense, is the important dimension. You're looking at the spatial sort of behavior. Here's another example. Here I have, this is more abstract physically, but it's still a map. See, look, y, z, these are spatial dimensions. See, this is a particle. I, I wrote a description. This is a, this is a charged particle in a uniform electric and magnetic field, and those fields are oriented perpendicular to each other. But uh, the fact of the matter is that what I want you to see is that this particle it does this bouncing motion. So this is a, all of these graphs are really physical and a really nice way of understanding sort of what the particle would feel as it, you know, here it would, it would have very little acceleration up here and then it would go, ouch. And it would, you know, in a sense, it would have lots of in, infinite acceleration here. And it would, so you can sort of get a sense of uh, the physics of, a particle or what, what's going on to a particle by looking at these maps. But often, often maps are not, sorry here, 
maps are not the best way of understanding reality. But see, they're very physical. They're, they're, they're very, um, they're really nice to see. And, and they're sort of the way uh, we learn about graphing as a map. But graphs don't always have to be maps. And I think the, the, the first example you would have uh, encountered of graphs not being maps would be something like distance versus time graphs. Because you know we can't see time. A any graph that's plotted versus time is not a map of, of space, obviously, because time, time and space are not the same thing in our normal sense of uh, the way we live. And so, uh, for example, distance versus time. So uh, let's, let's plot distance versus distance. So maybe, uh, okay, so say I uh, went from home to school. Okay, so say the origin is home and this point here is school. So this is distance, this is X and this is Y, right? And say I went, um, say I went kind of just in a, uh, say, say I started really slow, okay? So I started really slow, uh, how, how would I, I guess I'll use very close together dots. And then I sped up as I, so I, started speeding up. So, so you can see where I'm trying to illustrate. But this was my path, right? How would this look on a distance versus time graph? Well, I would have covered, you know, this amount of distance, which is the square root of x squared plus y squared. So you can see I'm, I'm already sacrificing the nature of the path, right? I'm, I'm using the distance formula. So this is my distance, right? The path becomes my distance. And my distance, I was accelerating, right? So my distance the amount of distance I covered in time oh, I still that, uh, increased as time went on, right? So here, I, here I started very slow. I was not covering much distance. And then as time went on, I got faster and faster. In other words, I was covering more distance per unit time. So you can see that this is not a map of your path. This is not what my path looked like, right? This is an important thing I, I want you to understand. This is not um, like the shape of my trajectory. This is the shape of my trajectory. This, this distance versus time graph is, uh, is how my distance evolved as a function of time. And time is not something you can see. So that's why it looks weird in like a par uh, parabola here. Okay. So any qu so I could have drawn something different, right? If my path from home to school looked even more exotic, then we'd have to think through it, right? So say school is here. So say, say my path was like loop-de-loop, -loop, right? Well, from physics, we know that when you go in circles, right, you're, so your distance is regressing here. So your, di so your distance from home to school, again, remember that distance is the square root of x squared plus y squared. In a sense, what I'm doing is a coordinate transformation going from here to here. Uh, so my distance here, I would be, you know, I would be, uh, say I was going at a uniform speed, right? So now my distance would be increasing and then it would be decreasing, right? There would be a, there would be a, some form of a curve, right? And hmm, let's see how it would. So, so yeah, so literally my distance. So note, I, see, well, I was about to go backwards in time, but that doesn't make sense. My, how would my distance look? So here I'm going backwards. I'm going back to, this is home, right? I'm going back home. But the way this would look is my distance would decrease, right? Because my distance from school, you can't go backwards in this graph, right? You can't, you can't go this way because that's going backwards in time. So, so my distance in this stage would decrease and then it would start increasing again, right? So it would decrease, that's, that's this little stage here. And then it would start increasing again because I start going back and see here my, uh, anyway, so, so now I'm getting even further from home and then it starts decreasing again as I go around this loop, right? Decrease and then it, and then it goes back, it increases. So anyway, so this is a very rough sketch, but you can see that this does not look like this. And that is my main point. Um, a distance, anything plotted versus time is not a visual graph in nature. So any questions about distance versus time versus position? Like a map versus distance versus time. Any questions thus far? No. Okay, and from my website, to give you a sense of what this really is, uh, here, look, this, these are graphs that this, uh, is the structure of a star, for example. So here, let's look at this. So uh, this, is not a, this is not a shape. This is mass, mass of a star, 
versus its radius. So this is just saying that as you go out, if you have a star and you're going out of its center, its mass increases according to this relationship. And so this is not, you know, this is not a map. This is just explaining a relationship between two variables, the mass and the radius. And there are other, you know, luminosity versus whatever, right? Uh, okay, so you get the point. Um, okay, I have a bunch of emails that I probably should. Okay, I'll get back to the, this is more important than those emails. Okay, so it can be more abstract. So distance versus time is good, right? Because it's, it, it, it removes us from a physical sense and gives us some hints as to, you know, what, what is really going on in a problem. For example, you know, when, when I was going down like this, you know that, oh, I was getting closer to home at this, at this point. You, you lose the detail of that loop, remember? But th this loop-de-loop -loop in which I was getting closer to home in that, in that case. But uh, this is sort of, sometimes what really matters is not the shape of the trajectory, but just your distance, right? So you lose some information, you gain some information. But you can get more abstract. For example, if you're traveling with a constant acceleration, then you then you have this notion of velocity. So, okay, let's 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 think about what it means to stand still. Okay, so say I'm just standing here, right? So some of you might have seen this in physics class, but I'm going to explain sort of what's going on. Say you're standing still, then your distance is not changing as a function of time. You know, this is a this is a flat line. This is not this doesn't have any slope. Well, then your velocity is zero, right? Your velocity would just look like a line, a horizontal line here. And same with your acceleration, right? If you're not if you're not moving, then you don't have any velocity. And if you're not if you don't have any velocity, then you don't have any acceleration. And why don't you have any velocity if you're not moving? Because velocity is the rate of change of distance, right? So if your if your distance is changing, then you have some velocity. And in turn, acceleration is your rate of change of velocity. But if your velocity is not changing, then you don't have any acceleration. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. So for a constant, if you're just sitting, right, then you don't have any velocity. What if you're moving at a, you know, what if you're moving steadily? So like, say I roll a ball across a table. Can you imagine that? So I have a ball and I just roll it and it's just moving steadily across this table. It's covering an equal amount of distance per unit time. Then its graph would look like that. It would just look like a line. And then its velocity would be constant, right? Its velocity is not changing, but it has some velocity. So that velocity is not zero. Maybe it's five meters per second or something. Okay. But what, what, can someone tell me what its acceleration would be? Zero. Yes. It's, it's, so its velocity is not changing, right? You can see its velocity is constant, which means its, its acceleration is zero. Right. Okay. So does that make, so this means that when you have a, when, you're, when your distance is increasing linearly, your velocity is constant, your acceleration is zero. What if your distance is acceler... What, what if you're uh, moving like this? So you're getting faster and faster and faster. So remember that example of going from uh, uh, home to school? And it, you know, I, I gave you that example, not, not this one, but the first one that I gave you, where you, know, you started slow, like you started with these little tick marks and slowly you got faster and faster and faster. And I denoted that with the size of these lines. So you started like at a snail's pace and then you started at a, then you started jogging and then you started running and then you got into a car and you zoomed off to school. Then your distance versus time will look like this because here you were covering very little distance, see very little distance per unit time. So you were not much farther from home, even after quite a while. But then as you started, you know, walking or running, your distance started increasing, increasing a lot more per unit time. See, this is like some unit of time. And here your, in, your, your increase in distance was much more than your increase in distance for that same unit of time here. Here you only increased your distance that much. Here you increased it quite a lot more. And here even a lot more for that same unit of time. So this means that your, your uh, velocity is, is also increasing, right? Because the distance you're covering per unit time is, is, is changing in a situation. So your velocity now looks like this. So now what does your acceleration look like? Someone tell me. Horizontal line. Looks like a horizontal line because your velocity is now changing linearly. 
right? So that means that uh, just as remember, just as when the distance was a horizon, was a uh, was a constant line, you know, in like our last example, and that made the velocity a flat line, horizontal line. Uh, the same thing is going on here now, just to a second level of abstraction, in a sense. Now your velocity is uh, a linear function, right? Looks like y equals x, kind of, and your acceleration is now a flat line. Okay, so this is just an example. I just wanted to introduce you to this idea of becoming more abstract with your graphing. So graphing is not always a map. Graphing is a way of modeling reality in, a, in, in whatever is a convenient way. So say you're testing out a car, right? And you're working for a car company, car manufacturer, like you're an engineer. And you wanted to see what the acceleration on the car was. Or maybe you're an engineer for NASA. In fact, I don't know if you know, but Anya is working for NASA in the, in the fall. She's uh, working on communications for NASA. Pretty amazing. Uh, so say you wanted to model the acceleration experienced by a rocket entering the atmosphere. And say it was something like, like this. You know, say you're, so, so maybe you want to translate that into distance. Maybe you want to make that a velocity. Anyway, what I'm saying is that um, your, your data, this might be some data that you collect, your data can be transformed into different, uh, different types of graphs. It can be turned into a map. It can, you, know, you, can, you can graph things based on what you want to understand from a situation. So it's not always a map. Uh, I was going to do maybe a few examples of a distance versus time graph. So uh, I'm going to ask you all to tell me sort of, I'm going to draw some arbitrary distance. So this is distance, this is velocity, this is acceleration. I'm going to draw some funny looking uh, path, not path, uh, distance versus time graph. Okay, so say you're going up and up and up and then you, okay, so you hit this point and then you go down. So what would the velocity versus time graph look like? Can someone tell me? What would it look like for this first part? Of the motion for this part. A horizontal line above the x-axis. Nice, nice. A horizontal line above the uh, below the you know v equals zero line, right? Because your velocity is positive, you're going in a positive direction, and your uh, the reason it's a horizontal line is because your velocity is constant. In other words, your distance is increasing linearly. Now, what would this part look like? Here, your distance is not. First of all, your distance is decreasing, right? Um, and uh, and it's not linear. So what would this part look like? Don't be shy. So first of all, which direction are you moving in? The positive or negative direction? Negative. So You're I think it would be below that axis. Yes, right? good. It'll be below this axis. So it'll be, your graph is going to exist somewhere down here, right? And if it's, uh, it, so you're start, you hear your velocity is fast, right? And now it's going down to zero. And this looks kind of like a parabola. So you're, you're, you're decelerating. This is what decelerating is, right? So it's like, you're going really fast and then you slow down. It's like that, right? So you're going really fast and then you stop on the brakes and then so you, you crawl to a halt. So, so you would st start down farther and then go up. I guess. So that, that's, this is what the block, so here there's a sudden break, right? And that's why I denoted it by a sort of dashed line because here you were, you were your velocity was going and now uh, and you saw, suddenly started moving in the opposite direction. Good, and now what would your acceleration look like? What does it look like for this first part? Zero. Zero, good, because your velocity is constant so your acceleration is not changing. Now what about for the second part? Uh, I think increasing. It is increasing, right? Because your velocity here really? is, uh, see, even, even though you're, you're coming from the, you know, um, let's see here. Yeah, even though you're, you're traveling in the negative direction, you're, you're, you're accelerating in that direction. So, um, yeah, so it'll, it'll be a, it'll be a, above the axis and it'll look like that. So good. So this is sort of the, the level of thinking that uh, I just want you all to, you know, it's fun to just draw your arbitrary graph and see if you can map out what's going on. It's hard, it's hard to do. And this is really what you're really learning. This is actually perfect for tomorrow. What you're really learning is how to take a derivative. Uh, you're, you're going to learn tomorrow 
that the derivative of distance is velocity and that the derivative of velocity is acceleration. So this is a very like intuitive way to develop your notion of differentiation. So for the juniors and seniors, just keep that in the back of your mind. Good. So remember these graphs that I was showing you on my website, like this graph, right? X and Y. See this equation? Okay, well, don't, don't worry about this. Never mind. Don't worry about this equation. Both X and Y here are functions of time, right? So uh, th this is what is called a parametric graph, okay? Yes, Leanne, you do have a quiz today. And Adi said, I've never seen this. No, this is not on the SAT. I said yesterday that we're not covering anything further that's on the SAT, really. That's not our focus anymore. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Okay, not, this is not to scare anyone. You do not need to know Lagrangian dynamics on the SAT or even in your first few years of college. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, people, just enjoy, enjoy this. This is just interesting to me and I think should be interesting to you. Okay. Okay, so, so parametric graphs. So these are things that where you have, you have time, right? Time becomes your independent variable. So remember in our normal sense of graphing, like if I had y is, f, you know, y is x, what is my independent variable and what is my dependent variable? Anyone? X or Y? Please participate. X is independent, Y is dependent. Thanks, thanks. Good. By the way, who is participating? Who is this? I can't see your name. Is it Mauricio? It's Aditya. Okay, okay. Thanks, Aditya. I appreciate it. Okay, please participate. Um, yes. Now, in so x is independent, y is, y is dependent. Y depends on x. Um, in parametric curves, your your independent variable is time, and your dependent you have two dependent variables, and those are x and y. So often in parametric graphs, you're plotting in a plane or plotting in space, and Time is running forward, but you don't plot time. See here in this graph, we plotted our, ind our independent variable, but in parametric graphs, you don't plot the independent variable. You only plot the dependent variable. So time is running in the background, so to speak. And um, you can get graphs like a spiral. Uh, that's the, so the, the spiral is the solution to this equation, right? This, this, don't worry about this equation. This is a coupled second order, uh, partial differential equation. You don't need to worry about any of that, but you, you can see that time is not expressed in this graph. So both of the, you know, R and theta are sort of your coordinates and I converted that to X and Y. So this was a polar, don't, don't worry about the details here, but you, you can see that time is not plotted and yet X and Y are both a function of time. So in a sense, what I should write is to, to, to denote that X and Y are functions of time, I should write this. And I have some examples. There, there was a great website I found uh, to, to demonstrate some, some parametric graphs. And, th and this is great for physicists, especially. Physicists love parametric uh, curves because um, often things in nature are functions of time and you have different uh, functional relationships in both x and y directions. So here's a graph. Well, let's see if I can edit. Okay, good, I can edit this. So here, you know, I can set time. So this is where the particle started, right? So I have some behavior, you know, X is some function, sine 2T plus 3 sine T, and Y is 2 sine 3T, whatever that is. It could fall out of an equation, something. Um, so as I run time forward, right, so here time is just begin. so here the particle started at the origin here, right? And now I'm going to run time forward, and you can see that, um, you know, time is not being plotted in this thing, only X and Y is being plotted. But as I run time forward, you can see it pass, right? And this is the, this is sort of the way the graph falls out, right? So the, um, so as time goes forward, the particle makes this exotic trajectory and then it repeats itself, right? So anyway, okay, so you, you, can, you can plot simple, this is actually a pretty sophisticated plot, but you can plot things that are simpler, for example, Let's see if I can edit this graph. Yeah, sine of t 
cosine t. Can anyone guess what this would give me? What I just plotted? If x is sine of t and y is cosine t, can anyone guess what the shape of the path should be? Would it be a circle? Yeah, what makes you say that? Good. Just because um, of how the unit circle works, I was just thinking. That's right, and you might remember, actually, we're, we're going to discuss this in just a bit, that uh, in polar coordinates, our cosine theta is x, and our sine theta is y. And we talked about how you know, the, the equation in Cartesian coordinates for a circle is x squared plus y squared is 1 for the unit circle, and how you can write this as the same thing, you know, r equals 1. Right, which which means that cosine of x is uh, cosine of theta is x and sine of theta is y, and that's exactly what I have here. You know, sine theta is well, I flipped it. I'll make this cosine and sine. Okay, and now I'm going to run time forward and look. See, it plots a circle, and it's actually going to go around twice just because of the way my my range is defined. Okay, so good. So you can see that time again is not being plotted on this graph, and yet we have this uh, this notion of uh, it passing as we plot the graph. And you can play around. I, I can send this, uh, this GeoGebra thing is a really great website. Um, you, can, you can make really fun, exotic trajectories. Like, let's just play around here and see. Okay, so I just modified this equation a little bit. And you can see that you can make a hyperbolic looking shape, for example. You can also make, so, so maybe you're, this is like a particle oscillating in a hyperbolic os oscillator, right? See, it's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay, you can also have, you know, um, maybe something like, you know, a vertically oriented graph, right? And it's, so anyway, so you get the point. Uh, often these, these graphs use sine and cosine because these are nice ways to model reality. And, but they don't have to be trigonometric. You know, you can have, you can have, you know, t squared and, uh, yeah, one of these things can be going as the square, right? So anyway, you, you can play with these things. This is really beautiful, actually. Uh, here, your particle starts. Uh, see, it starts out from way out here. And starts out from infinity, and it comes in, and it sort of compresses flips around and goes off to infinity. So, so I'm going to send this link in the chat. I'll send it at the end. Okay. So anyway, this is, this is the, the realm of parametric graphs. And for the quiz today, you're going to need to know which coordinates are involved in which uh, coordinate systems in the, in the different coordinate systems we discuss. Good. Okay. So any questions about parametric graphs, your function, uh, you have two independent variables, uh, sorry, one independent variable, which is time denoted by T and two dependent variables, X and Y. And those are functions of T. No questions. So uh, I want to talk a, a little bit more about polar coordinates. And I didn't talk about, we, we, we introduced spirals, but I didn't get to graph you any spirals. So we're going to spend some time on spirals. Okay. But first I want to remind you what polar coordinates are. Polar coordinates in the plane, planar polar coordinates are, you know, using these variables R and theta, right? Um, the radial, uh, component and the angular component. So if this was my polar grid, R refers to your, your distance from the origin and theta refers to your angle from this reference line. This is the, ref this is the theta equals zero line. Okay, and how do you get from um, R and theta to X and Y and vice versa? Well, I just actually reminded you to get from here to here. Well, I guess it's more important to get from here to here largely because that's what we're often trying to do. Um, X is R cosine theta, and Y is R sine theta. So these are the coordinate transformations to get from Cartesian to polar. And you can invert them. In other words, you can solve for theta and R, right? And um, in terms of X and Y, and we don't really need to do that. Um, but yeah, you, you, you can, um, I mean, it, we, we, Let's, let's, let's avoid that conversation for now because it's, it's sort of less important. Um, it should be equally important, but often we're going from Cartesian to polar. So um, 
So these are your coordinate transformations. What does this actually mean? This means that if I'm working in a polar grid and say I wanted to plot something like y equals x, this is as, as Cartesian a plot you could get, right? This is as Cartesian you can get. And we know what this looks like in x, y coordinates. It looks like that. But say I'm working in polar coordinates. And here I have a polar grapher, right? You can see that my polar grapher doesn't look like Cartesian coordinates. It has, it has this radial, these radial, you know, these circles denoting the radial direction. And it has this notion of angular distance as well. So if I wanted to plot this, literally, I would just plug in these substitutions for x and y. So y is r sine theta, and x is r cosine theta. And now I would, you know, cancel the r's, and I would have sine theta is cosine theta. But you know from trigonometry that if I divide both sides by cosine theta, what do I have? Tangent of theta equals one, right? Because tangent is just sine divided by cosine. And so if I plotted this in my grapher, I better get a, a line that looks like y equals x. So I'm going to write the tangent of theta is one. Boom. And you can see, indeed, this looks. You see this line, you know, I can zoom out, zoom in. It just looks like a uh, y equals x. Okay, so that's, that's one example. How about something more exotic? Uh, like, uh, say you wanted to plot uh, y equals x squared, and I wanted this to be in polar coordinates. How would I do this? I, well, it's the same exact thing. I would put, put my r sine theta for y, for y and r squared cosine squared theta. Remember that cosine squared theta is the same thing as cosine of theta squared, all squared, um, right? So this is according to my substitution. And now one of the r's will cancel. So I'll get rid of this r, and this will become a 1, right? And I can divide by cosine squared theta. So I have an equation explicitly in terms of r. And so now I'm going to plug this into my grapher. So this better give me a parabola. You know, you know that this, in Cartesian coordinates, you know that this looks like a parabola right? that goes through the origin. Let's see if that's what we get. So I'm going to put in uh, r equals sine theta divided by cosine squared theta. Oops, cosine squared theta. Look, indeed, I got a parabola. This is what we were expecting. And it's in polar coordinates, right? So this is the equation of a parabola in polar coordinates. This is the equation of a line in polar coordinates. So it's important to be able to go back and forth. But um, the real utility of polar coordinates is to graph things like spirals, things that occur in nature, things that would be really hard to graph in Cartesian coordinates. So there are various types of spirals. And the two I really want to talk about are the, uh, the first one is called the spiral of Archimedes. And Archimedes was a great, um, was a great uh, you know, scientist, mathematician, and he was he, he, did, he made a lot of contributions to the field of like elementary fluid dynamics. He, he was really interested in fluids and many other things, many things in geometry and algebra as well. And the spiral of Archimedes is sort of the simplest spiral there can be. And its equation in polar coordinates is just linear. In other words, the radius grows, this is just alpha, just some constant. The, the radius grows proportional to the angular, you know, the angular coordinate. So remember in, um, when we were talking about our early, the first day of this course, when we were talking about linear equations, we gave you this equation, right? And this just gives you some line with slope m that goes through the origin. This is sort of the analog in polar coordinates. So in a sense, it's the simplest thing to graph. Not really the simplest thing, but it's one of the simplest functions to graph in polar coordinates. And what does it look like? I'm just going to put it in. Uh, say alpha is 1. So then I would just have r equals theta. And you can see. I'm going to have to zoom out for you to see it. But it, and it would go on. This thing doesn't graph everything, right? But it would go, it, it, you can see it loops, and it loops again. And there are some good graphs. So I'll, I'll type in spiral of medes. Uh, there, are some, there are some better graphs. So you can see that it looks something like this. And you can see that the spacing between the arcs, between the, the arms, is constant. So the space in between this arm and this arm is, is a fixed distance, and that is the same distance as this, and that is the same distance as that. Here's a better diagram. You can see that the spacing between the arms does not grow. And it actually turns out that this is not the way spirals often work in nature. Spirals in nature uh, do not have a fixed width. 
between their arms. So spirals in nature are not often the spiral of Archimedes. And spirals in nature uh, often follow the form of the logarithmic spiral. So, so logarithmic or the log spiral. And those are of this form. And these are analogous to, so I'm gonna write the analogous thing that we talked. So here we talked about, okay, anyway. Uh, the, these are analogous to uh, exponential functions and they look like this. So K is another constant, it's just a free parameter, you can adjust it. Um, so here's the analogy. Uh, linear functions, Y equals MX is to R equals alpha theta as exponential functions, Y equals uh, E to the X, uh, R to uh, logarithmic spirals, R equals alpha times E to the K theta. And by the way, um, some people missed this question on the quiz yesterday. So, okay, this is an aside about analogies. What is an analogy? Uh, this was kind of analogy. Okay, what, what I just made is an analogy. So, so y equals mx, this is the way it's denoted, is to um, the, log, the, the Archimedes, spiral of Archimedes as, that's denoted by four dots, as um, the uh, exponential function is to the logarithmic spiral. R is alpha um, e to the k theta. Okay, so anyway, this is analogy. And the question on the quiz that everyone, almost everyone missed yesterday was, um, what it was an analogy question and it was asking, um, uh, addition is to subtraction. Do you remember this? Addition is to subtraction as uh, exponentiation is, and does, does anyone know the answer? Logarithmic. Yeah, so ex exponents, yeah, the, the correct answer was logs. And the analogy, you know, here, I, this is an aside about analogies, but I also wanted to cover this because people missed this yesterday. Uh, addition and subtraction are inverses just as exponents and logs are inverses. So that's why logs was the right answer, right? You can, you can add something to something and then you can subtract that same thing and get back where you were. Similarly, you can exponentiate something and then you can take the log of that same thing and get back to where you were. That's the, that's the meaning of the inverse. Anyway, that's just an analogy. Um, so hopefully now you know what na analogies are. Okay, so anyway, what does the log spiral look like? The log spiral, is the beautiful spiral that we see in nature all the time. So this is sort of a boring spiral of Archim Archimedes. Well, the log spiral, I'll just graph e to the five theta. So let's, let's see, 100 theta. That's the, that's the opposite direction, 0 .00, 0 0.01 theta. That was kind of boring, uh, 0.1 theta. Okay, so you can see that the spacing here is not constant, right? The spacing between uh, the origin and this arm is not the same as the spacing between here and here. And, and I'll, I'll pull up a better graph. A more, the, the grapher I'm using does not go fully. So anyway, you, you immediately get these beautiful graphs. And this is the famous, uh, this is tiny, sorry. But you, you know, the famous uh, sort of shell, the conch kind of shell. Um, anyway, this is a great graph logarithmic spiral, and this even has an animation. Anyway, this is the shape that galaxies take on. This is the shape that hurricanes take on. This is, like I said, the shape that seashells take on. Uh, this is really the way nature operates. So uh, see, you can see here, uh, these are all logarithmic spirals. And in fact, this grapher, uh, let's see if I can pull this up. This grapher has some presets, um, toroid, no, conchoid, conchoid. So you can see that, uh, here, you know, th this, this shape here is a logarithmic spiral. So this is a full graph, you know, in 3D and stuff, but really this, and you can see, um, I'm trying to parse this equation together. Uh, they've, they've done some coordinate transformation because they've plotted an X, Y, and Z, but really what's going on is this is, this is a logarithmic spiral. If you did a co appropriate coordinate transformation from X, Y, and Z to R theta, and probably uh, Z here, this is probably cylindrical coordinates. Um, you would, you would find that this is a, a, a logarithmic spiral. Now there's a special type of logarithmic spiral that I wanted to tell you about, and that is the golden spiral. Uh, and that is one of the, you might've heard of the golden ratio. And I, I urge you to read this Wikipedia page 
Um, the golden spiral is a type of logarithmic spiral, okay? But it has a special, you know how I, I introduced this factor K in the logarithm? So this is a general logarithmic spiral. Well, the golden spiral has a special value of K, okay? And that's what makes it um, so special. Um, and one way to illustrate, one, one way to understand sort of uh, the golden spiral is to look at the size of these um, these squares, right? So, so really what's going on is that um, there's a sequence called the Fibonacci sequence. And uh, that's why it's also called the Fibonacci, Fibonacci spiral. And uh, the area of those squares grows according to that Fibonacci sequence. And the golden spiral is found everywhere in nature. So, um, so anyway, you can see here the, the Fibonacci numbers, you know, one, two, three, four, 7, 11. Anyway, so that the spiral intersects at certain points of these squares. Uh, so, so really what I want you to know is that the golden spiral, which you'll hear about a lot, is uh, a type of logarithmic spiral. Okay, good. So we've talked about polar coordinates. We've talked about spirals. We've talked about sort of the things I wanted to discuss um, that I didn't get to, got to discuss earlier. But all of these things have been in 2D, right? All of these graphs have been in two dimensions. What if we go and now introduce a whole other dimension? three dimensions. And we've already looked at some graphs, you know, of the cone. We've looked at conic sections and things. But mm, what are sort of the analogous things to Cartesian and polar coordinates in 3D? So in 2D, we had Cartesian planar coordinates, right? And we had polar. So these were all planar coordinates because they were in the plane. And we also had polar coordinates. And I talked about earlier, I, I introduced this briefly, how when you go to 3D, you introduce obviously another dimension. And this leads to uh, several, this mainly three famous, um, three famous coordinate systems. One is Cartesian that, it, it, you know, it, it's the same thing as the planar coordinates, except it has an extra letter, Z. And the polar coordinates, that is a tree that branch, it has two branches. So the polar coordinates are theta. There are two ways to add an extra dimension. You can have R theta phi, so some third angular measure, or you can have r theta z. That third measure is uh, similar to r in the sense that it is a linear coordinate, right? It goes, um, so anyway, uh, we'll, we'll see a few examples of this. R th this is called spherical, so write this down because you, you need to know the sphere quiz. This is spherical coordinates and this is cylindrical coordinates. So this is definitely not on the SAT, but these are the three famous 3D coordinate systems. And I just want to show you a few examples of some of these coordinate systems. OK, so Isaac, OK, so first of all, Aditya, yes, you can get the quiz earlier. Um, Isaac said there are three different types of galaxies. That's right. And uh, if people want to talk about the different types of galaxies, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, yeah, there, there are barred spiral galaxies. There are. Um, there's actually this thing called the Hubble tuning fork, and it looks like a, it's, a, it's a classification of galaxies. There are many types of galaxies. Uh, some of them have spiral shapes. Some of them are elliptical. Anyway, yeah, look, re read, read the Wikipedia page. Wikipedia is, is great for that kind of thing. OK, so I, I'm going to graph a few things. Um, I'm going to graph, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm going to start in x, y, z, the, the simplest of the, in a sense, the simplest 3D um, the simplest 3D graphing system. So here are my x, y, and z coordinates. And if I graphed, you know, something like z equals one, I would get a plane, right? This is a plane. So remember when, um, if I had, if I was working in 2D, x and y, and I graphed something like y equals one, I got a line. Now that I'm working in 3D, I have uh, relaxed a degree of freedom in a sense, I, or I've increased my, my options. So z equals 1 defines any point on this plane, not just any point on a line like I had in 2D. Um, but here it's any point on this plane. And similarly, I could have you know, x equals 1, and that would be a vertical, would be a vertical plane, right? So here's x equals 1. I could have, so these are analogous to my things like y equals 1, right? Or x is 1 on, in, in my 2D system. Um, and, and I could also have y is five, maybe. So that's a plane a bit displaced, a bit further displaced from the origin. So anyway, you can, you can see, uh, 
yeah, these are, these are big planes. And here they, it's cut off, but obviously these things go on off to infinity. It's just a wall. Good, but things can be more interesting. For example, I could plot something like something you all would, would recognize. Can anyone tell me what this will be? If x squared plus y squared equals one was a circle in 2D, what should x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one be in 3D? Sphere. Good. And indeed, it's a bit jagged looking because the resolution on this is not great. But yes, it's a sphere. You, you can see these little bumps, dimples. That, that, that's just to, to illustrate that it, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a solid object. Good. And the radius, it, it, just, it works exactly the way a circle works, right? The radius is where this equal sign, you know, where I'm typing here, this is where your radius squared goes. So if I want a radius of two, I would put four here, right? And now my, I have to zoom out, but now my radius was doubled from where it was, so on and so forth. And you can manipulate, you can change this, you can add coefficients and make uh, things that aren't a sphere, but maybe spheroidical, you know, a spheroid or an ellipsoid, right? So here you have a squished ellipse, right? You can see it's like a pancake, right? And this is called, and does anyone know the name of this? I'd be impressed. It's okay if you don't. It, it's called an oblate spheroid. It's, it's really an ellipsoid, right? Because it's based on an ellipse, but it's called an oblate spheroid. And you can also, if I increase one of these numbers, this is called a prolate spheroid because it's squished in the vertical direction. And so it turns out that the Earth the Earth, the entire Earth, Mother Earth, is a tiny bit like this. This is an exaggeration. Maybe a tiny bit like this. So it's a bit of an oblate spheroid. And the reason being that the Earth rotates. And because of this rotation, uh, different parts of the surface experience different amounts of acceleration. And that makes it slightly squished on the outside. And actually, the result of this is that the, the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of Earth near the equator is a bit larger than the acceleration due to gravity uh, at the surface, um, you know, at the poles. So balls fall slightly faster <laughs> uh, if you're near the equator, very marginally, very, very marginally. But uh, th this is all part of the field of, ge you know, we were talking about geodesy, this field of mapping out the Earth. Uh, this is all part of that field. Anyway, so you can play around, you can, uh, you can have fun with this. You can also even remove, you can change some of the powers and get interesting conical looking shapes, right? So here I removed one of the powers on Z and now I got a, what is called, does anyone know the shape of this? What does it look like in 2D? You know, if I just plotted it here. Looks like a parabola and in 3D it, it, it is called a paraboloid. You can orient it in different directions. Um, you know, here it's, a, it's, it's oriented in the uh, Y direction, paraboloid. This is actually a famous shape because all the famous telescopes of the world have mirrors that are parabolic. What is special about the parabolic mirror is that incoming light, see if I was a light ray and I hit this beam, all the incoming light gets focused at one point. And this is in contrast to spherical mirrors, right? Spherical mirrors have, uh, they don't have a focal point. Parabolic mirrors have a focal point. Spherical, mirror, uh, spherical mirrors don't have a focal point. So they're cheap. Uh, parabolic mirrors are really expensive because they're hard to they're hard to grind. And uh, but all like Hubble Space Telescope, James Webb Space Telescope, these all have parabolic mirrors. So Adi said, so if the Earth supposedly stretched out more someday, would it would the flow of energy accelerate? The flow of energy is a very vague. What you just described is a very vague thing. I don't know what the flow of energy is, but yeah, the, if you want to talk about the gravitational field. The gravitational field will evolve as the shape of the Earth changes. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, well, th like things like gravity. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. It's a good question. What you, Adi, your real answer is lies in the field of vector calculus. So when you take a class in vector calculus, you'll understand sort of how uh, mass can be distributed and causing different gravitational effects.
that's really what, you know, tidal force, you might've heard of tidal forces. Like if you go to the ocean, tidal forces are exactly uh, due to the deform, uh, deformities in the, um, well, they're not due to that, but they're, they, the effect is that, that, you know, you have tides, you have all sorts of crazy oceanic effects. Yeah. One effect of tidal forces is that the moon is drifting away from the earth by the rate of one centimeter per, I think, century, something, something crazy. Um, maybe it's one centimeter per year. Anyway, yes, yes. The shape of the planets and shapes of distributions, if even charges and things, uh, affects the the fields they're surrounded by. Okay, good. So I don't want to dwell too much on, on uh, spherical coordinates. I, I do want to do one last example of uh, cylindrical coordinates so you can see what that's like. Here, in a sense, it's more boring than, um, it's a bit more boring than um, what we were talking about earlier. But uh, here, you know, you're, you're your your um, and so you sacrifice one of the angular dimensions for a linear dimension, which is z. So you can, if you wanted to plot a sphere, you would just. Uh, sorry, if you wanted to plot a. Um, let's see here. Okay, so a plane. You know, you can still plot a plane, which is really hard to do in spherical coordinates. Uh, but you can also plot things like. You know, sphere. So it's a it's a compromise between the Cartesian coordinates and the the planar uh, and the and the uh, and the spherical coordinates. The cylindrical coordinates. Okay, good. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I think I hope today was somewhat rewarding. We talked about all sorts of things. Um, I'm going to send you this quiz, uh, and I hope I didn't put anything on there that was not covered. So let's see here. chat. Okay, people, the quiz is about to go out. Okay, so ninth and 10th graders, so long. Um, enjoy the rest of your summer. Uh, keep me posted. Send your score when you when you register for the SAT, send your score to Dr. Lee. And uh, I'm going to send you your grades in about a week, a week's time. So, uh, you're free to leave once you finish your quiz or now. I'll stick around for a few minutes.